So uh, first of all, congratulations. You made it all the way through Isaiah. Um, it, it's, a, it, it's a tough book, as we said, uh, right from the very first session. Um, and I know some of you have said to me sort of offline and privately, it's a tough book. I'm not quite sure what I, what I just read. Um, <laughs> but, but hopefully um, your understanding has deepened uh, no matter where you were um, coming to the book from, whatever kind of background, whether this is the first time you read Isaiah or the 17th time you read Isaiah, <laughs> learn something. So we are uh, in doing Isaiah 56 through 66 which is not only the last session, it's also a uh, discrete unit. Mm -hmm. uh, if you, you pick up any uh, commentary on Isaiah and it will always deal with 56 through 66 as uh, mm -hmm. the final unit um, be, for, for one main reason and then a sort of sub reason, it uh, features the whole section is what is called a chiasm. That might be a new term to you, it might mm. not, uh, but it's basically what I have there on the screen. There will be a, a first element that will be mirrored by the last element. And then there'll be a second element, which is mirrored or echoed by the second to last. And then the third by the third to last. And then there will be um, something at the center of a chiasm. Chiasm, uh, chiasms were pretty typical in ancient literature. They were a tool that was taught in schools of rhetoric. And the, the, the main point of the chiasm is, is the point. The, the, the main point is what's in the middle. Uh, some, and we'll see this tonight as we go through it, that um, sometimes what gets dealt with in the first time gets dealt with differently the second time, but it's still uh, the main topic of, um, of conversation. So, but the, the main point is always in the middle. We find chiasms throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament um, and in other ancient literature, a common rhetorical device. And this entire 10 chapters is a chiasm. And this is... Um, what the, the chiasm of 56 to 66 looks like. We're gonna go through this element by element. And instead of going chapter 56, 57, 58, 59, et cetera, as we've done um, for the past many, these, low these many weeks, uh, I'm gonna deal with the first element that's echoed at the last element. And then we'll go to the second element and the second to last. And then we, we will end up in the middle, which is um, the point of the chiasm. Have I lost anyone yet? Mm -hmm. We're all good? Yeah, it's a little confusing. <laughs> well, hopefully it will, it, it will, the longer we go on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and you'll see, I have the chiasm still on the right side of the screen. I know the, 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 it's small, but you'll be able to see, I'll highlight in pink as we go through the chiasm. So you'll be able to see us drill down into the center. Can you make a hand out of that? Can I? Mm -hmm. that, will, will you please make a hand out of that, those verses uh, and stuff? Sure. Can't write make... fast. <laughs> Thank you. Well, well, let, let me let me back up. How's that? Is that can you? Uh... What I can do is I can take a snapshot of it and send oh. it to you, Lucia, if that's ha helpful. Good. Thank you. I can't do that that I know of. I never tried. I, I well, can also very kind. Uh, I, I can do a sheet on it too. Um, it is a little detailed. Mm -hmm. But again, I think I think it'll come to light the the more we go through. Okay, thank okay. you. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
we begin uh, the, the first element, which is echoed also as the last element, is the place of foreigners. One of the things we're going to, um, I said this last section had two main points. One is the chiasm. The second is it functions almost like the book of Isaiah in miniature. Um, all of the major themes that we've been learning about uh, over the last eight weeks are going to uh, be seen again. They're going to reprise themselves one last time in this last uh, 10 chapters. And one of the major points of Isaiah, as we've been talking about from the very first week, is this, the, the broadening view that um, Isaiah, one of the things we learn from Isaiah is that God is not just interested in the family of the, of Abraham, of the nation of uh, Israel and Judah, but that God is what God is really concerned with is the entire world. Uh, and do you remember the first 12 chapters of the book deal with Judah? The next bit mm -hmm. deal with nations that surround Judah. And then the next bit after that was the whole world. So we, we've been going like this um, the, the whole time. And we reprise that here um, with the, the, the place of foreigners. Let me just read through this bit. Here, we're first going to deal with eunuchs, and then we're going to deal with um, foreigners. Eunuchs were uh, Israel, Judah, the Jewish people had no mechanism to make eunuchs. They had, they, there was no like uh, social royal structure that determined that people were to be eunuchs. In fact, in the Torah, uh, those who were eunuchs were all automatically considered to be on the outside of society and were, to, were considered to be unclean. And so because Israel didn't do it, Judah didn't do it, they were also foreigners. So they're foreigners that also have this extra weirdness attached to them. And uh, what we're going to see here is that their foreignness and their extra weirdness does not preclude them from being a part of God's kingdom. So Isaiah 56, three to five. So the foreigner who attaches himself to Yahweh is not to say Yahweh will quite separate me from among his people. The eunuch is not to say, here am I a dry tree because Yahweh has said this to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths and choose what I want and hold on to my pact, my covenant. I will give to them within my house and within my walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them a permanent name, one that will not be cut off. <laughs> this would have been incredibly radical at the time mm -hmm. uh, that the, the notion that God would even deign to um, wrap his arms around and make a covenant with eunuchs. Mm. And then, uh, and the foreign people who attach themselves to Yahweh to minister to him and to give themselves to Yahweh's name, to be servants to him, I will bring them to my sacred mountain and let them rejoice in my prayer house. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be for acceptance on my altar, which again, would have blown people away back then. Mm. Um, I mean, I, the, they could sort of imagine foreign people coming and uh, we'll, we'll tolerate them while we do our thing. But for God to now say, I will accept their sacrifices on my altar. If they want to sacrifice to me, they are welcome because my house will be called a prayer house for all the people, which is, of course, uh, we hear that again in the New Testament. Anybody remember the context that we hear that in the New Testament? Mm -hmm. 
Jesus uh, walks into the temple. He sees all the money changers and uh, everyone selling everything. And he turns over the tables and he says, my, my father's house was to be a house uh, of prayer for all people. And you have turned it into a den of thieves. So um, Jesus, in, in one of the most um, striking moments of the gospel, gospels, um, quotes directly from mm. Isaiah. Mm. <clears throat> Let me see. Oh, one of the things to that's important when we read this is that when we when we hear foreigners, I don't know what images or thoughts get conjured in your mind, but he's talking about us. That's us. We, we aren't Judahites. We aren't Israelites. Um, the 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 fact that other peoples as Paul says, got grafted into the tree of God was a, was a mercy and a grace. We're the foreigners that whom, whose sacrifice God will accept. We are, we are the people who are welcome uh, in this house of prayer for all people, which is part of what makes um, uh, people call Isaiah the fifth gospel, because that mm -hmm. of course is the message of the gospels. Jesus did not just come for one people, one nation, uh, but came God for God. So loved the world, which is um, good news for us. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, when we get to um, uh, the very end of the section, so now we're in chapter 66, but as for me, on the basis of their deeds and their intentions, the gathering of all the nations and tongues is coming. Uh, by, by tongues, he means languages. Mm -hmm. So all nations, tongues, they'll come and see my splendor. I shall set a sign among them and send off from them survivors to the nations. They will tell of my splendor among the nations. Um, he, because as the new heavens and the new earth that I'm going to make are going to stand before me, this is Yahweh's declaration, so will your offspring and your name stand. New moon by new moon, Sabbath by Sabbath, all flesh will come and bow low before me. Any, any bits of this sound familiar? Um, anything... Um, ring a bell in here revelation yes mm -hmm. which part new heaven and new earth. the new heaven and the new earth mm -hmm. right um in revelation chapter 21 then i saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away um back in revelation 7 um uh, we get something that um echoes this part of the verse. Uh, After this, I looked and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Um, Isaiah and Revelation uh, are linked so often um, in, in, in terms of imagery and in terms of language. And part of that reason is because they were both written in times of um, great trial. Uh, horrific things were happening in Isaiah's time and in the time that John writes Revelation. And so both of their messages, the, the, common, the common thread is, yes, we're going through this terrible time, but God has not forgotten us and mm -hmm. something even better is coming. Mm -hmm. And it's it, and it's going to be for all of us. We saw that in Alpha and Omega a little earlier. <laughs> right, right. That was was that last week, I think. Yeah, I think it was. Right. I think I showed the the altar which has mm -hmm. Alpha and Omega. Mm -hmm. All right. So now we're going to go to the second element. So we so we go back to chapter fifty six, and um, this is uh, well. It, so another common uh, theme in Isaiah is that the people have messed up big time, right? We've heard that over and over again. And that theme reprises itself again. So he says, call with a full throat, don't hold back, lift up your voice like the horn, 
Tell me people about their rebellion, Jacob's household about their wrongdoings. They inquire of me day by day and want to acknowledge my ways like a nation that has acted in faithfulness and not abandoned its God's ruling. So uh, God, the people are calling, they're acting like uh, everything is good. They ask me for faithful rulings. They want to draw near to God. Why have we fasted and you haven't seen? We've humbled ourselves and you haven't acknowledged. Um, fasting is a hard thing. We, we did a uh, adult forum on fasting some years ago. It's, uh, it's hard. And so what they're saying is we've done these hard things and we feel like, God, you just haven't like done anything about it. It's a little disappointing to us. So then God responds there on your fast day, you find what you want, but you oppress people who toil for you. There you fast for argument and strife and for hitting with a faithless fist. You don't fast this very day in such a way as to make your voice heard on high. Will the fast that I choose be of this very kind, a day for a person to humble himself? This will be the fast I choose, won't it? Loosing faithless chains, untying the cords of the yoke, letting the oppressed go free and tearing apart every, every yoke. It will be dividing your food with the hungry person, won't it? And bringing home the humble, the poor, the downtrodden. When you see the naked, you'll cover him and not hide from your fellow flesh and blood. Then your light will break out like the dawn and your restoration will flourish speedily. So it starts out with people are like, gosh, we don't, we just don't feel like God's listening to us. We're doing all this religious stuff and it, we should be pretty good. And God says, yeah, you're doing all the outward stuff, but, but then you're hurting the people around you. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the, uh, one of those other themes uh, is the theme of, of justice that you, the, the people who are most vulnerable are always commanded by God to be treated well and cared for. And they are doing the exact opposite. So God's like, I don't care about your fasts. Like mm -hmm. do whatever you want with that. Just uh, take care of those who are around you. Now, this is one of those, th this is one of the elements of the chiasm where it, we're gonna talk about the same topic, but it's gonna be talked about from a completely different angle. So. It, the, in the previous one, it was the people were crying out and doing all this religious stuff just with no effect. In Isaiah 65, I could be inquired of people who didn't ask. I could be found by people who didn't seek help from me. I said, this is God speaking, I'm here, I'm here to a nation that wasn't calling on my name. So the, the first one, Back in chapter 56, they were calling on God's name. It's just they were doing all the other stuff um, behind God's back. Now it's the people don't even call on my name. I spread my hands all day to a defiant people who walk in a way that is not good following their own intentions. The people are ones who provoke me to my face continually, sacrificing in the gardens. This, this means sacrificing not to him but to mm -hmm. other gods, mm -hmm. burning incense on the bricks, ones who sit in tombs, who spend the night in secret places, meaning uh, trying to commune with the dead, um, who eat swine's flesh, who don't keep kosher, with a broth of desecrating things in their bowels, <laughs> who say, keep to yourself, don't come near me because I'm too sacred for you. They do all this um, worshiping of other gods mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. own God, we're too holy. Um, mm -hmm. for... Let me stop there. For just I'm going to take a breath. And um, any thoughts, comments, mm -hmm. questions you've noticed? Hmm. When we were reading this, were we supposed to realize this chiasm? Because no, no, we came close to it. <laughs> we would. Because it's not a rhetorical device that we would ever use today, right? 
I'm never going to write a sermon like this. No one's ever going to write a uh, magazine article like this. It was an ancient form of communication that ancient people were aware of. And mm -hmm. I guess some would have caught it, some might uh, not have. But we're, we're pretty sure just how intricate it is that Isaiah meant this. Is it becoming clearer, I hope, as we go through? Yes. Okay. Uh, chapter 59, um, there are uh, prayers for forgiveness. So we've just done a section where uh, Israel's waywardness, their sins uh, have been highlighted. So the next section, section is going to be, ooh, yes, we have done that. And, oh, God, uh, we need some forgiveness. So Isaiah 59, going back to the uh, first part of the chiasm, that's why the exercise of authority is far from us. Faithfulness doesn't reach us. We look for light, but they are darkness, for brightness, whereas we walk in gloom. We grope like blind people along a wall, like people without eyes we grope. Because our rebellions are many in your sight and our wrongdoings have testified against us, because our rebellions are with us and our wayward acts, we acknowledge them. Um, so there, there's a silver lining there, right? Like we have these things that are going on that shouldn't be going on, but we also have a recognition that, oh, we've done this thing and, and mm -hmm. we need forgiveness for it. Going to the end of the chiasm, chapter 64, this is one of my favorite lines in all of Isaiah. Uh, we get it once every three years in church, and um, I always love it. Oh, that you'd torn apart the heavens and gone down. You, you ever have your life such a mess that you just like immediately want intervention? right? That you immediately want relief. Like, oh, yeah. this is terrible. Uh, oh, that you torn apart the heavens and gone down. That mountains had quaked before you like fire, lightning, lighting brushwood, so that fire boils water to cause your name to be acknowledged by your adversaries so that the nations might tremble before you. But now, Yahweh, you're our father. We're the clay you're our potter, the work of your hand, all of us. Don't be so very furious, Yahweh. Don't be mindful of our waywardness. Uh, a lot is made, of course, of the imagery of God being a potter. Mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, of course, is reminiscent of uh, Genesis chapter two, where God scoops up the, the earth and forms uh, humanity in his hands. Paul will pick up on this imagery in the ninth chapter of Romans and, uh, and talk about how God is our potter and that uh, and because of that, God has certain privileges um, as our creator that, that we don't have. Is that an image that works for any of you? Mm -hmm. God is Potter. <laughs> it makes hymns come into my mind. <laughs> There's lots of anthems about this. <laughs> like what? Um, well, the, it, it, it describes you are the Potter. We are the clay. We are the, uh, I, I, I don't know the title of it. I'd have to sing it for you. <laughs> I'll look ahead. it up. Sing it. I'll find it. <laughs> I think I can sing one, but it sounds more like da 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 da. Yeah. Nice. It's it's kind of like Handel's Messiah just kind of comes out in your head when you read a line. Yeah. This one brought up another anthem. If you find it, stop me and because I'd be interested in that. Okay. Um. The next bit, and uh, this is another one of those major themes in Isaiah, is that God is the judge. God is the arbiter between uh, what is wrong and how to make it right. Uh, throughout Isaiah, God judges 
Judah. God judges the nations around Judah. God judges the world. God judges uh, the king. Um, God is, uh, you know, the, the decider of what is right and wrong. So Isaiah 59, the first part of the chiasm Yahweh saw, and it was bad in his eyes that there was no exercise of authority. He saw that there was no one. He was devastated that there was no one intervening. Kind of reminds me of the very beginning at the first call scene of Isaiah, uh, where Isaiah is in the heavenly temple and God says, who will go for us? Like, like no one's intervening. And so we, we, we need someone to intervene. And Isaiah says, I'll go. But his arm brought deliverance for him. His faithfulness, it sustained him. He put on faithfulness like a coat of mail and a deliverance helmet on his head. Um, in the Isaiah 63, the back end of the chiasm, this is a little, uh, well, the, the imagery is strong. Why is your attire red? your clothes like someone treading in a wine trough. I trod a press alone from the peoples. There was no one with me. I tread them in my anger, trample them in my fury. Their spray spatters on my clothes. I've stained my attire because a day of redress has been in my mind, my year of restoration has arrived hmm. so it is is this um wine a metaphor for something else blood <laughs> yes exactly right i mean which is a uh more so in the new testament than the old but you know there's a classic biblical connection between wine and blood that we as episcopalians know all too well because we do this every uh, week, but that is absolutely the, the imagery that's going on here. Their spray spatters on my clothes. This is, um, this is a, uh, a uh, kind of a scary picture of, of judge. But now we go, uh, we, we, we leave the dark clouds of judgment and uh, blood spattered clothes. And from here on out, it's uh, blue skies and steady seas. Uh, and we have in this, as we approach the center of the chiasm, we get to this uh, vision of a restored and renewed Jerusalem. Remember the people um, are in Babylon. They've been there for 70 years and we're getting ready for them to get up and come home. Uh, Babylon will be thrown down and new uh, 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 Persia will rise uh, over them and uh, will restore Jerusalem to its former glory. So Isaiah 60, get up, be a light because your light is coming. Yahweh's splendor has shone on you because there darkness covers the earth, gloom the peoples, but on, on you, Yahweh will shine. His splendor will appear over you. Nations will come to your light, kings to the bright, to, kings to your shining brightness. I almost did the, uh, the Handel's Messiah version. Um, th this section is, uh, is a part of Handel's Messiah. It's actually the big bass solo that I've sung many times. Violence will not make itself heard anymore in your country. I mean, think about that to a people whose mm -hmm. home was utterly destroyed. Uh, men, women, children, elderly were destroyed, were killed in the streets. The, the streets flowed red with blood. They've been slaves in a foreign land for 70 years. Violence will not make itself heard anymore in your country. Like you're not going to have to deal with that anymore. Destruction and breaking in your borders. You will call deliverance your walls. Praise your gateways. The sun will no longer be light for you by day. And as brightness, the moon will not be light for you because Yahweh will be light for you permanently. Your God will be your majesty. And there's more. 
Your sun will not set anymore. Your moon will not withdraw because Yahweh will be light for you permanently. Your morning days will be complete. Your people, all of them, will be faithful ones who will possess the country permanently. They will be the shoot that I plant, the work of my hands to demonstrate majesty. Any imagery in there? Any words? Anything ring a bell? Any? Disappeared. I am the branch. Uh, I am the branch. No, I am I'm the vine. You are the branches. The branches. <laughs> yep. You could also do I am the light of the world, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Yahweh will be light for you permanently. There's also that. Um, section from Revelation, which this echoes almost word for word, uh, Revelation 22, there will be no more night in the city, and they will have no need for the light of a lamp or of the sun, for the Lord God will shine on them, and they will reign forever and ever. Like the, the our, our light source, uh, the, the sun will be supplanted by uh, God himself, such will be the brightness. Okay. We don't have to go far uh, for the second part of this chiasm. It's just the next uh, chapter, chapter 61, because we are almost at the center. The nations, we go back to the nations. Uh, the, the first part of this chiasm was strongly about um, the people of Israel, the people of Judah. And now the, the mirror image of that is where that... Um, Jerusalem is not just for Israel and Judah, but Jerusalem is for the, the world. The nations will see your faithfulness, all the kings, your splendor. You'll be called by a new name, which Yahweh's mouth will determine. You'll be, you'll be a majestic crown in Yahweh's hand, a royal diadem in God's palm. Pass through, pass through the gateways, clear the people's way. Build up, build up the causeway, clear it of stones. What causeway is this? What's, what's, the, what's the people's way? Anybody remember this? It's the, it's the long 700 mile route between Babylon and Jerusalem. Remember the people are a, a long way away. And they're going to go home. They have to traverse through the wilderness. And one of the minor bits of imagery that comes up again and again in Isaiah is the way, the causeway, the highway, um, this, uh, this road that God will sort of clear the way so that people can uh, go home. Remember, because they lived there for 70 years, it was a long time. There are, you know, no one ever even remembered being in Jerusalem at that point. It's a totally new generation. Not everyone wanted to go home, but God wanted them to go home. And so he said, pass through, pass through, let's go. There, Yahweh has let it be heard to the end of the earth. Say to Miss Zion there, your deliverance or your salvation is coming. Okay, so now we come to the center of the chiasm, which is, it's the main point. And hopefully, I, I'm, because it's only nine verses, I'm just gonna read the whole thing and let us marinate uh, in the center here for a second. And I hope you get the, um, the, the linkage to the New Testament here. And maybe we can talk about that for a moment. The Lord Yahweh's breath, remember the word for in Hebrew for breath is also the word for spirit. The Lord Yahweh's spirit or breath or wind is on me because Yahweh has anointed me. He sent me to bring good news to the humble or the poor, to bind up the people broken in mind, to call for release for captives the opening of eyes for prisoners to call for a year of Yahweh's acceptance, our God's day of redress to comfort 
all the mourners, to provide for the people who mourn Zion, to give them majesty instead of ash, festive oil instead of mourning, a praise garment instead of a flickering spirit. They'll be called faithful oaks, Yahweh's planting to demonstrate majesty. People will build up, sorry, build up permanent ruins, raise up the ancestors' desol desolations. They'll renew ruined towns, desolations from generation after generation. Strangers will stand and pasture your, pasture your sheep. Foreigners will be your farm workers and vine dressers. You, yourselves, will be called Yahweh's priests. You'll be termed our God's ministers. You'll eat the nation's resources and thrive on their splendor. Instead of your shame, double. Instead of disgrace, people will resound at the share you have. Therefore, in their country, they'll possess double. Permanent joy will be theirs because I am Yahweh, one loyal to exercising authority, hostile to robbery and evil. I'll give them their earnings and truthfulness, a permanent pact or covenant. I'll solemn. I'll so uh, that, that must be wrong. <laughs> I'll solemnize for them. Their <laughs> offspring will gain acknowledgement with the nations, their descendants among the peoples. All who see them will recognize them that they are offspring Yahweh has blessed. So now that we're in the center, uh, and the, the last verses of Isaiah uh, we're going to touch on. What do you think of the center? If this is the center, what, what's the main point that we uh, are supposed to come away with? Hmm. Hmm. Is it good news? Do we, do, we, do we end up on good okay. news? I hope? How about like an introduction? This is what Jesus read from uh to introduce it, to begin his ministry it's exactly right and and what's interesting was he ended at least in luke he ended in verse two and and the day uh, i'm sorry two a to proclaim the favorable year of the lord he did he stopped there and he did not say following and the day of vengeance of our god that was pretty interesting yes not not a not just a it's you know, but I'm sure he, he thought very carefully about where he where he would stop. Yeah, he 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 didn't want the downer on his, on the mm -hmm. on his first sermon. <laughs> yeah, this is um, mm -hmm. so in Luke chapter four we have what's called the Nazareth inaugural, where um, in in Luke's gospel it's the first thing he does after his baptism and the calling of some of the disciples. The first thing he does in ministry is uh, he goes home to his hometown synagogue. And uh, as you see on the page I have here, uh, the scroll of Isaiah is given to him and he unrolls the scroll. And with 66 chapters, it would have been a long scroll <laughs> goes all the way uh, to the center of the chiasm. The, the, the centerpiece that Isaiah wanted to highlight in this last section. And uh, as Steve says, he quotes it directly. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. Remember, we've talked about this before, anointed. Um, the Greek word for anointed is anybody? Oh, no. <laughs> Christ. Christos, uh, the, or, or Mashiach in uh, Hebrew, Messiah, Christ, mm -hmm. the anointed one. He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And I love this part, last part. He rolls up a scroll, gave it to the attendant, and sat down. It's like a, it's like a mic drop, as the kids say. <laughs> the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed, fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Um, so I, 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 
I think this lends even more mm -hmm. credence to the idea of the last mm -hmm. section of Isaiah being a chiasm because it's clearly the main point and even Jesus uh, notes mm -hmm. that it's, it's the main thing and he sort of bases his uh, first one sentence sermon on, um, on this passage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is often described as Zion's destiny, that section of uh, Isaiah. Yeah, a mm -hmm. and note, uh, I, I have to slowly go back through. When we get back into Isaiah, it's, it's Zion's destiny. Mm -hmm. It's also the nation's destiny. It, it's, it's the world's destiny, as Isaiah puts mm -hmm. it. Um, the uh, the a permanent joy will be theirs. And he's not just talking about Jerusalem there. He's talking about um, the, the nations. There it is permanent on this page, permanent mm -hmm. joy. It's the, the, this is that last grand vision. Um, you know, you could almost imagine the temptation would be to sort of round it off and close with uh, doubling down on um, the, the, the choice and the, the blessing of God's people, Israel, but, but here we still we still have that um, wide angle view for God so loved the world, the whole thing. Hmm. All right, I'm going to um, end the slideshow in a second, and then we can have some last points. Before I do. Um, let me just say next week is the uh, day before Thanksgiving. And so we will not be meeting on the night before Thanksgiving. Um, December 1st, however, um, I'll come back and I would love to have all of you back. Um, but I'm not going to plan a whole lot for that one. My hope is that you will uh, sort of lead that one. I've put together a sheet. The button is on the front page of the website already in the red block where it says Zoom, uh, where you, you probably clicked on the Zoom link to get here for the session. There's another button. It says texts. And if you click that, it will bring you to this PDF. And there's two texts that are coming up that will be read in um, church. Christmas Eve, we'll hear from Isaiah 9. Uh, verses two through seven, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. And then a couple, two days later, the, the Sunday after Christmas, we'll be reading Isaiah 61, uh, 10 through 62, um, three. And what I thought we would do is um, I would allow, uh, allow you, uh, all of you to sort of walk through. If you read them, if you print them, printed them off, and you went through and said, what was this text saying to the people of Israel's day? And what was this text, what is this text now saying to us in light of Jesus? That would be a really fun conversation. Um, and so I hope we can have that. Okay.